Hi, everybody. Hi everybody, my name is Erin Rogers and I'm the program manager for the Canadian Cultures Itinerary Fat People to People Ambassador Programs. And today I am joined with Philippe and he is a delegation manager on, from Canada. So welcome Philippe, how are you? I'm very well yourself, Erin. I'm great, I'm great. So I purposely did not say your last name because um, I'm afraid that I was going to say it incorrectly. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what your role is, and also your full name for us. <laughs> All right. So uh, I am Philippe Robichaud. Robichaud is a name from the far eastern provinces of Canada, the Maritimes, um, otherwise referred to as Acadia, way back when it used to be a sort of land on its own. Right now I live in Montreal. I was born in Montreal. Montreal is the biggest city in uh, Quebec and the second largest francophone speaking city after Paris. Um, I'm studying here, I'm living here and uh, it's part of the Eastern Cultures Tour or Canadian Cultures program. That's great. I'm a delegation manager on that program. I'm sort of a guide shaman. I show you around. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. So, how many um, how many itineraries have you traveled on as a delegation manager? Two. That would be two in French. Okay, great. Now, something that I wanted to talk about a little bit was um, a lot of times in the U.S. we call the eastern part of our country the East Coast or eastern part of the U.S. And if you look at a map, the itinerary that you're following is, is right above the, our, our eastern coast. So a lot of times we refer to this part of the itinerary as um, seeing eastern Canada, but that is not entirely correct. Correct? True. Um, if you, yeah, if, like you just said, if you split the map, it, it's eastern um, with regards to the western part, um, but at the beginning of the, the uh, settlers' um, arrival, uh, there, there was not much in the middle. There, they settled all the way out west and like the coast and the fertile valleys like the Okanagan Valley in the west, for example. Uh, and so the west coast got settlers at some point. The east coast was where it started, but in the middle there was not much. So even though geographically it's sort of center, um, it's to the east of the Big Divide which is the sort of flat provinces, prairie provinces in the middle. Okay. So it's more called a central Canada rather than eastern Canada. So that's the proper terminology that we should be using, correct? Two-thirds to the right Canada. Yeah, <laughs> central Canada works. Right. Okay. <laughs> so why are you passionate about the student ambassadors discovering this part of Canada, this part of the world where you grew up? Well, I've always been passionate about uh, telling people about things I've seen because I'm also passionate about hearing uh, about where people come from. And uh, this part of Canada is where I grew up. Uh, I had, um, I had gra my grandparents living in Ontario, uh, so I, I visited that part quite a bit, but I've always lived in Quebec. Um, historically, it's very significant for any American who wants to know where their continent, um, continent's constitutional history is from, needs to visit this part because the first, um, the first settlers among New England, New France, came through this uh, St. Lawrence Way, and uh, the entire continent at one point, uh, the most important city for strategy was Quebec because it was like the sort of path into the waterways of the entire continent. People who traveled down the Mississippi, went across the Great Lakes, uh, had to go by this Quebec because that was the main waterway. So you'll see um, all the most important historical um, how to say, founding points of the country, um, or most of them, are going to be covered on this program. I'm passionate about showing you the, the origins of white man in America. Okay, great. Now, something that I forgot to mention at the beginning was that 
Um, and for all the viewers out there that are watching live, you're welcome to post uh, comments and questions live, and we'll be monitoring those, um, and we can answer them along the way. So, um, what is one of your favorite itinerary activities on the itinerary uh, for the Canadian Health Program? Well, there's this expression in Quebec that says, um, "Prêche pas trop pour ta paroisse," which means "Don't preach for your uh, for your uh, for your church" type of thing. But I'm going to do that anyways. Um, one of my favorite stops, and it's been a f staple for the both programs I've done, is the Sucrerie in Rigaud. Um, the Sucrerie is this. Uh, it translates in English to sugar shack. Essentially, you're in the woods. Uh, you have a log cabin that was built for P2P. This is true. Um, and you get to sleep in an authentic log cabin as, the, as it was built uh, way back in the days. Like the guy who built it will actually show you, like, this is from that part of the forest, this is from that part of the forest. He cut every single piece of wood in the cabin himself. And after you get plenty of fresh air, you walk around the woods, you stuff your faces with as much food as possible while people play music, either on the violin or the piano, in the uh, main lodge of the Sugar Shack. It's quite fun. Yeah, I've seen lots of pictures from last summer, the last uh, trip that we did there, of the students dancing, having a great time, and the food sounds fantastic. Lots of the sugaring off meal, as we call it, the you know, ham and split pea soup and crusty bread. It just sounds so wonderful, especially after a long day of hiking and um, working up an appetite, I'm sure. Well, actually, there's a little asterisk to be added to that. Um, the sugar shack, usually there's a sugar shack season um, in this part of the country. Uh, you have uh, maple that flows in the springtime mostly, so people usually go in April or March. Uh, but you guys have a little special opening up. Um, you uh, you have access to a sugar shack in the summer, so you get the best of both worlds. You get the warmth, uh, and you get like well, the maple sugar that most people eat in the spring. <laughs> It sounds delicious either way. It sounds good to me. So, so what on our student programs, we often talk about the exclusive act and unique activities that are available only to people to people. Can you talk about one of those activities? Um, well, apart from that sugar shack activity, there was... Um, well, every single activity is open potentially to other people, but tailored to, to people to people. So one specific one, um, that's a, that's a hard, hard one that's been tailored for people to people, probably the um, why Marsh would be one of them. Um, there's an itinerary uh, specific uh, why Marsh along with the um, uh, Huron, uh, Huron Wendat village. Uh, that you guys will get the chance to see. Uh, the itinerary through those places uh, is specifically um, aimed at people to people uh, to go along with the um, the history lessons that you get in the uh, sort of book, because um, you guys will have a, a book to accompany your, uh, or a, a sort of textbook to accompany your learning of Canada. Um, You'll get. Uh, well, I don't want to steal any surprises if I describe the whole thing. You'll get to s do some canoeing. I don't say more. <laughs> okay, we'll keep that one quiet then. <laughs> I don't want you to spill the beans too much. So, when Canada um, is, is a bilingual country, as you've been speaking some French terms and, and saying some French names as you've been talking, now. In the part of Canada that the students are going to be traveling to, a uh, majority of the people speak French. Is uh, English a common language that is spoken by most of the people in the areas that we're visiting as well? Yes. Um, there was a really uh, careful um, attention uh, made to split the trip halfways. Uh, halfways for territory, for provinces, halfway for um, nature versus city, but also halfway English-French. 
So the first six days of the program are spent in Ontario, which is a, by and large, Engl Anglophone province. Uh, so it will be actually very rare that you'll hear French for the first half um, of the program. However, as soon as we switch into Quebec, and that happens on the seventh day, where we actually cross the border from Ottawa to, to Gatineau, um, you'll notice not a drastic change in the buildings, but a drastic change in what's written everywhere. Since 1977 in Quebec, you have this law called Loi 101, Bill 101, um, that says that everything has to be written in French. So as soon as you cross over, at one point you might go like, okay, what was written on that sign? I wasn't sure exactly how they spelled that. That's because you'll be in Quebec. So the other half, yeah, you'll be in Quebec and you'll actually mostly hear French. We'll translate for you, uh, but most of the people will speak French. They'll understand English, but it'll be a little different than the English you're used to. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Any time I travel to another country where English is not the first language, um, you know, most people do speak. Uh, it, it's usually common and easy to find somebody that does speak, but it is always a little different. So which is the fun of traveling, right? So on this itinerary, uh, there are a lot of different unique overnight stays. I would say this itinerary more than any other itinerary that I have ever worked with and, and at People to People, there are many, many different unique overnight stays on this itinerary. What is your favorite overnight stay uh, that you would say? On this I like the woods. I like the cabin. Um, that's just my preference because you you wake up smelling like fresh logs and like oxygen and you sleep wonderfully. Uh, but the other like all time favorite for most other people who like comfort and stuff uh, has been at the uh, Carriage Hill Resort. Um, you get sort of like four star rooms with plush beds and TVs and air conditioning and. Well, it's not my cup of tea, but I think it might be yours. So <laughs> depends on your taste. We have extremes. Yes, there definitely are extremes between that and overnighting in a jail cell and overnighting at the Cosmodome and a space pod and sugar shack and an army barrack. There's lots of different opportunities for students to try that is for sure. So you said at the beginning of the our interview, um, our hangout, that uh, this will be your third program that you're going to head through this summer. So out of the two that you've had under your belt so far, what is a memorable moment that you, you know, you, you witnessed from a student ambassador or just from your entire delegation that just blew you away? I've had quite a couple. Um, I, how can I pick one? Um, I, I ho hopefully there'll be no uh, none of the other delegations that will get access to this because then they'll be like, well, what about me? But there was this one kid, for example, that was or one ambassador, shall I say, um, that was actually a recording artist. He had his. Um, Twelve. Year, uh, he had a. Uh, he was twelve years old and had his album out on iTunes already. And uh, having this knowledge, uh, prior to the program, I had convinced um, Sir Douglas uh, to liberate the funds for a gitelele, which is a small guitar that we uh, we called Gary the gitelele. And so a memorable moment was, for example, when we gave a concert, impromptu concert on top of the CN Tower. There's a sort of observation deck on the CN Tower. We brought the thing up, we brought the Gitelele up, and we just had, oh, the, there was a couple of um, students as well that were, uh, they sang in a gospel choir. So we had a jam on top of the CN Tower. CN Tower. It was, it was a memorable moment. That's awesome. That is really cool. The talent that at a younger age, just blow me away. They always do every time I travel with them. They're just the ambassadors are awesome. So move because I'm hearing voices. I know it's getting uh, noisy in there. So I'm going to uh, just ask one more question because we're running short on time too, and I want to respect everybody's time. Uh, what would you do, say is your number one travel tip 
for uh, students traveling to Canada this summer? What is their number one item or items that they should definitely plan to bring with them? Um, I'll twist the question around, and the number one, uh, and instead of talking about the number one item you should bring, I want to talk about the multiple items you should not bring, actually. Okay. Because the, the the main issue that we've had, especially going up the stairs at the jail, I remember like two horrible panic scenes where um, like 50 kilogram suitcases were not um, lifted by 11 year old people, and so I just had to err, throw everything up the staircases. So it was fun for my shoulders, but not for. Um, the time spent waiting for that to happen. Um, Canada is not as cold as you might think it is. You do not need to bring winter jackets. Not necessary. You do not need to bring multiple jackets. One jacket will be fine. There will be colder nights, um, but you you need some warm clothes because during the day it's 20, 25, 30 degrees Celsius, which is like 90 uh, degrees Celsius. We've even hit some uh, Fahrenheit, we've even hit some hundreds um, during the program. Have some warm clothes, but not too many of them. Okay. So, the more uh, layering pieces, they start out the day and then you can take off, off the layers. Exactly. But you don't need a lot. Like, if your suitcase weighs more than okay, kilos to pounds, more than, I don't know, 40 pounds, you're going to have a hard time carrying it. That's my number one tip. <laughs> That's a really good tip. I like it. Well, thank you so much, Philippe. It doesn't look like we have any questions, so it sounds like you have answered all of the questions for our viewers today. I appreciate you taking the time, and um, have a fantastic trip this summer. You guys are going to have a great time. Well, thank you very much. All right. Have a good day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.